But it's 2.32 and what goes up must come down. And yeah, we sent someone up to Washington or maybe down to Washington uh, yeah. a few years back and she hasn't done the job. So it's time to bring her down and send somebody new to Washington. Uh, Republican Jeff Deal is with us in the studio right now. Jeff, thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. Barry, thanks for having me in and thanks yeah. to the audience for listening. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so how's it going out there? Well, I was just mentioning off the air as I came in here, it's extremely busy, which is a good thing problem to have. We had the kickoff last Tuesday in my hometown of Whitman. Uh, my daughter was able to introduce me, which was a nice thing. Hundreds of people there. Uh, John Dennis, a former radio host in the morning, actually was uh, the MC, and we actually found out that Kurt Schilling endorsed us on the same day. So, you know, it things kind of accelerate pretty quickly once you make this move into uh, running for the U.S. Absolutely. Senate. Absolutely, and Kurt Schilling was considering a run for the uh, for the spot himself. So he was. He's endorsed you for it. That's right. Yeah, he's got a following. He's got a political following as well as a, uh, a sports following, too. And I bet you you know who Kurt Schilling is because we've had so many He did not Democrats. pitch for the Yankees. No, he didn't pitch for the Yankees. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, so uh, Jeff Deal, a Republican uh, state representative from Whitman, and uh, he has a history here in New Bedford. He used to work at Point Out Signs here in New Bedford, right? Exactly. It's funny. I was driving down. I passed Kyler's Seafood. I actually did that that big sign on the side of their building, that huge Kyler's Seafood. Oh, no kidding. That was one of the things that I had done. The retail uh, operation they have next to the, the factory, the, the processing plant, that retail, uh, we did the sign over that as well. So really nice uh, to see one of my old signs uh, still holding up. Still working, right? That's 508 500 is the phone number if you'd like to call if you have a question or a comment for Jeff Deal. And uh, I know uh, personally I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, next year's campaign. Uh, many of my listeners um, are, are supportive of, of, of what you're doing and uh, have expressed a, a great deal of disappointment in the job that Elizabeth Warren has done to this point. And it's amazing. We came across a story earlier this week. She was on um, uh, WG. BH's uh, Greater Boston program, and and she was being interviewed by uh, uh, whoever the, the the host of the program was. I don't recall at the moment, but was being asked about Deval Patrick and Deval Patrick maybe running for president. And somewhere in the middle of that interview was a very revealing line that nobody else picked up on. And and, and, and that line was that she has not yet spoken to President Trump. Trump has been in office seven months now. And our senior citizen, a senior senator, has yet to have a conversation with the president. It's How pretty, is that representing the people? Pretty astounding. In fact, our whole congressional delegation from Massachusetts consists of all Democrats, men and women, congressmen and women, uh, Senator Markey and uh, Senator Warren. Some of them protested the inauguration. Uh, Elizabeth Warren has gone one step further and has tried to block every single nominee to Trump's administration, including uh, just the other week, last week, an overwhelmingly bipartisan vote for the new FBI director. She voted against one of five people. She not only is unwilling, it seems, to speak to him. And by the way, she wouldn't shake Betsy DeVos's hand after she was uh, had her hearings with the Senate uh, for confirmation as a secretary of education. You know, this is somebody who clearly does not want to work across the aisle to deliver for the state of Massachusetts. And I should remind people that we had a senator at one point who was a Democrat. He was called the liberal lion of the Senate. That was Ted Kennedy. But when elections were over, he would work with a Republican president. He would work with a Republican governor to deliver for the people of Massachusetts. If we're, we are doomed as a state if Elizabeth Warren continues on as U.S. senator down there because she will have no relationship with the administration. And uh, that's really what's most alarming to me with her running. And, and the other thing, too, is... It looks to me, based on the amount of time she spent out of our state fundraising for fellow Democrats around the country to try to, you know, help them uh, make connections with them to get support down the road, and fundraising for herself. I mean, she has over eleven million dollars, I believe, in her war chest. She's been working on it since she's gotten in office. She's been building that war chest up, yet has yet to deliver for Massachusetts in any substantial way, in any way, with anything she's filed to help financially Massachusetts. She's written two books in office, made one point six million dollars for herself personally, but hasn't delivered for us. It's time for someone to go down to Washington that's going to work for the people of Massachusetts, not just for a far left politi political ideology and for our, herself, which is just building up her profile to run for president, using Massachusetts as a stepping stone. Well, as you know, the New Bedford economy really largely depends upon the fishing industry. And uh, our fishing industry has been uh, pounded in recent years between federal regulations. The and monument status. The uh, monument status was declared by Barack Obama. And, and Liz Warren has yet to even take a public position on whether she thinks that monument status is, is good or bad for the industry. And I know many in the fishing industry are waiting to hear her say something about this. Yeah. No, I think that that was a total mistake. And the fact that she's not weighing in now, uh, which something that could certainly help influence changing that policy. I mean, I'm sh I know that... 
President Trump right now has a commission looking at getting rid of some of these monument statuses, she should be weighing in immediately saying, yes, take this one right off the table. And, you know, you also have the issue, as you're well aware, I'm sure, and your listeners are well aware, obviously, of 42 potential federal fishing licenses at risk in New Bedford uh, because of Carlos Rafael and his situation going on. She has yet to weigh in, I believe, on any of that uh, proceedings where other states are looking to have them reapportioned. There's a there's a, uh, a main organization, a fishing organization, that is trying to convince Washington to take those 42 and redistribute them outside of Massachusetts. We need them in our state. We need them in New Bedford to make sure we maintain uh, those fishing licenses because it's not about any one person like the Codfather. It's about the families of the fishing uh, fishermen. I think it's like 240 something, 242 I heard was a number, fishermen and their families depend on those licenses to keep their uh, their income coming in uh, to support their their uh, their work. Well, that would be a significant blow. And I know the mayor has been working hard to try to convince Washington to keep those licenses here. And it would be helpful if we had a U.S. senator who could knock on the president's door and say, hey, you know, here's what we need and here's why we need it. And, and again, she won't even speak to the guy. Yeah, not just that. I mean, look, I've met I've met the president. I know the governor of Massachusetts, Charlie Baker, who I think We'll have a, a good shot at re-election here. I, I know those two players. I certainly would be able to have a much better seat at the table on delivering for this state. And I think that people in Massachusetts are starting to become aware of the fact that Elizabeth Warren seems to be completely about obstructing anything about moving America forward. We voted for change in 2016, including states like Pennsylvania, which had always favored Democrats, Michigan, Wisconsin. We moved away from that people looked at, at donald trump beyond party and said look this guy's challenging people who are republicans for gosh sake he's trying to deliver for the american people that's what i want to do deliver for the people of massachusetts well you know it's interesting too because you're absolutely right i mean folks who voted in this election and, and gave donald trump a chance in the presidency did so because um, um they weren't following traditional party lines but because they wanted change they had an agenda and he shared many items on that agenda with them, the forgotten man, the forgotten woman, and he went to Washington to, uh, to bring about change. 20,000 Democrats unenrolled in the primary to vote for Donald Trump in a time when it, when it was between uh, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, it was a 50-50. She won barely by percentage points. So it wasn't Democrats playing games with the election primary there. 20,000 Democrats, according to the Secretary of State, unenrolled to vote for Donald Trump because I think they said he is beyond party lines. And it was very clear during that primary that the National Republican Party was doing everything they could to keep him from being the nominee as well. They were working with... Uh, well, now they're working to prevent him from getting his agenda done. And it's, it's it's difficult to watch that many of these Republicans who he, crossed, he carried across the finish line on his back are now uh, working against them. And to, to listen to Mitch McConnell this week, the Senate Majority Leader, um, suggest that uh, Trump has, quote, excessive expectations expectations uh, that he is not in the game. He doesn't know the game. And uh, it's extremely irritating that Congress has earned the reputation of not accomplishing anything. He's frustrated that the president is putting pressure on Congress to get something done. That's why you're there to get something done. Yeah, this is an embarrassment down in Washington, what's going on as far as the lack of effort to support him and the agenda that the American people put forward, whether it's fixing health care, which is broken. I mean, we voted for Scott Brown in Massachusetts in 2010 because he was going to be the 41st vote against Obamacare. He was right. The people of Massachusetts were right. Households haven't seen a savings of $2,500 a year. They have seen a massive increase in their premiums, in their deductibles, to the point where it's an unaffordable care act, and it needs to be fixed. Washington, the Republicans, should have stepped up to the table and fixed that. That's one thing. Uh, tax reform's on the table now. They better make sure that they work with the president on that. Uh, Americans right now, it's whether it's taxes or fees, uh, you know, we're getting killed and businesses right here in Massachusetts are suffering from uh, overtaxation, which prevents you from growing your job business, which then prevents you from growing your jobs. When I worked at Point Signs, I got a chance to meet with mom and pop shops all over the place, whether it was Fall River, where it was Dartmouth, right down in New Bedford. I got to meet with business owners talk to them about their dreams, their visions, about what they wanted to do, the product or service they wanted to give, because that was going to be reflected in their brand that we would put on their building. And so talking to them about their businesses, you you know that it's a challenge. You have to invest capital. You have to invest time and labor. You have to write paychecks for other people. And to keep that going, we need government as a partner, not trying to just use people or businesses as an ATM for the next thing that the government wants to fund. And uh, that's been really how Washington's been operating for way too long. Both parties have been guilty of neglecting 
the people that, that voted to put them down there. And they're all guilty now of not working with the president of trying to deliver on reform that he promised, including, you know, this border wall. I, it was very clear that people wanted to have a secure border, uh, not just there, but also vetting those who come in and out of our country with that travel ban. It was going to take a chance to revisit how people are, are screened when they come into our country. Let's not forget that it was the Marathon Bombers, the Zernaya brothers, who were flying back and forth from Chechnya, their supposed country of refugee, and they were being radicalized while they were going back and forth and ultimately caused the Marathon bombing. There was a, it's clear now, we, we know that there was a failure between local law enforcement to pick up on the red flags that federal uh, people were putting out there about them going back and forth to Chechnya. Now there's an effort in Massachusetts by politicians to try to make sanctuary status where local law enforcement, again, can't work with ICE officials to identify and deport those here illegally with criminal backgrounds. It seems to make no sense whatsoever. And Donald Trump and Jeff Sessions have been trying to make an effort to say no sanctuary status as well. And they may use economic pressure to try to make that happen. I, I agree with them. And by the way, you have a great sheriff, Bristol County Sheriff Tom Hodgson, who has been a leader on that issue. Um, the fact is, we want immigrants in our country. We just want people coming here legally. Uh, anybody who has immigrated, you know, probably feels that they were duped if if we're just going to allow people to come illegally and get all the benefits that, that they could have gotten had they not gone through the process themselves. So we want to make sure we have a legal immigration system that works for everybody and at the same time allow ICE officials to do their job of keeping those who are here illegally with criminal backgrounds out. Which brings us to the RAISE Act, and that was uh, discussed. I think you and I spoke about this last week after you announced your uh, – um, your candidacy. I mean, we've got the RAISE Act that's being proposed by some members of Congress and, and the president that would set strict rules, um, things that, that, that were just common sense a few years ago. you got to have English. you got to be able to support yourself when you get here. you got to have uh, access to a job, uh, you know, once you're here and so on and so forth. Um, people automatically assimilate when they have those values and they come to this country and they contribute economically rather than draw back from the, from the country. If we and go this to, is getting pushback already. If we want to go to other countries, if an American wants to go to another country, they have to prove that they have a certain amount of assets and a job before they go there. It's the same. The door should be swinging both ways. It should be a two-way street. And it's funny. I, I think about this because what's old is new again, right? We used to have rail systems that would t transport goods and people around the state or around the country. We moved to autos. You know, now we're trying to what's, push. What's to, rail? We don't have one of those now, around here. Now they're pushing <laughs> to get rail back, you know, because yeah. it might be a more efficient way of doing things. A hundred years ago, you used to be able to immigrate into the United States by going to your local district court, talking to the judge. You had two years by the time you were in the country to decide if you were going to be a citizen or not. And then you would have three more years to prove to the judge you had a job, a sponsor, knew the language. You know, all the requirements they're talking about now were the requirements back then, a hundred years ago. And the judge could then swear you in on the spot once you prove that you met those requirements. That's all that we're asking is people that come to this country are coming for the right reasons. That's all we want. And by the way, there's always been a quota on the number of people coming in from any one country. We've always set quotas. Uh, that's nothing new as well. We just have had a very porous southern border that has just caused a massive influx without any way to document them. Mm, and just look around at the heroin and fentanyl that's all over the streets. And where do you think that's coming from? That's coming over the border with a lot of these folks that are just crossing at will. Right. And that's created quite a problem in this country. No and question and Massachusetts that. ends up being a red, a red carpet state for people coming here illegally because we roll out all the benefits with very little verification. It's caused major problems in the past. We actually had at risk our driver's licenses not, of not being able to be used as ID to board uh, passenger planes because the federal government was saying our, there was not enough integrity in the system to determine if people who had those licenses were here potentially as terrorists. Mm. That's how incredibly dangerous our situation had gotten. That was the Deval Patrick administration, and he, by the way, is thinking about running for president. Can you imagine? Yeah, yeah, that's what we need, Deval Patrick and Liz Warren in Washington, right, at the same time. Um, you realize there's a lot of people that are listening to this right now or, or watching this uh, on, on Facebook or on uh, our YouTube page or whatever that are saying, boy, this guy's a racist, he's a xenophobe, he hates, uh, he hates immigrants, and uh, he just, uh, you know, doesn't want immigrants here that, that, that just don't understand. We're a nation of immigration. I mean, New Bedford has one of the biggest populations, uh, you know, of, of immigrants uh, in the state. I mean, a lot of our big cities do. It's never been an issue about that. It's about people coming into our country, doing it the right way, doing it legally. We have to have some 
method by which we screen people and make sure they become citizens. And by the way, those people who are here illegally end up, you know, it's very tough for them. First of all, they're working under the table a lot of times, so they're not going to be eligible for a lot of the benefits down the road, social security benefits, that if they became a naturalized citizen, they would become eligible for. So it's a, a workforce, you know, that's being worked sometimes under the table at twice the uh, hours, at half the rate, and uh, it's bad for them. They're not going to get those long-term benefits, like I mentioned, and they tend to be sort of taken advantage of by uh, people who know how to put pressure on them saying, you know, unless you do this sort of an extortion, I'll turn you in. So the illegal immigrant community, I, I think we all want to see that dry up and have them become the citizens that they want to be as well. I hope they all want to be citizens. That's the goal is to have this big, big melting pot work for everybody. Let's just switch over to North Korea, a situation that's getting uh, very, very dangerous in the last, uh, well, it's been dangerous for a long time, but uh, particularly so in the last few days. And um, very tough rhetoric coming out of Washington. The president uh, saying you keep up the th nuclear threats against us and you're going to see fire and fury, the likes of which the world have never seen. Um, I, I think Kim Jong-un actually said something to the effect of you're full of baloney this morning or something along those lines. So the medic got lost in the interpretation, but he's threatening to lob four missiles next week sometime in the direction of Guam. Uh, Japan says, well, we can take them out of the sky, no problem. So, I mean, we are getting to a point right now where I, I don't remember such harsh rhetoric, and I've been around for a long time, probably going back to the Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, we're at a point right now where somebody with a, uh, an itchy trigger finger could, could set something off here. How do we defuse this? Well, it's tough to watch. I am glad to know the technologies out there and the capabilities out there to knock those missiles down, which allows us, you know, if they do cross that red line, I suppose at that point, it's going to be time for uh, taking more dramatic action in North Korea. I mean, you know, what we know now, too, is that they've got a lot of missiles along the border that basically target just about everywhere in South Korea that once they're triggered, you know, very little time, I think two minutes before that country becomes just a giant battle zone, uh, which is terrible. But the other thing, too, I think there's other partners out there like China that don't want to see this turn into a conflict. China themselves has been sort of propping up the North Korean regime for a long time, just giving them enough food and enough uh, resources to maintain the current control they have. I don't think they like the, the situation that's in North Korea, but at the same time, they don't want a massive migration of people from North Korea into China because it would be something that would really overwhelm them in their capacity to try to handle that uh, crisis, that, that whole uh, humanitarian crisis that could ensue. So I think China needs to continue to be a partner with the United States on this in figuring out a long-term solution. And, you know, I don't want the uh, situation where we would have to park nukes in um, our Easter, in partners in those in that region. I think that sends a bad message. But at the same time, we have to be ready to do something to deal with the um, the leadership in North Korea that's that's doing this. I don't know if that's SEAL team action down the road or, or what, but again, I'm, I'm hoping that China decides that they're going to be a partner in this as well. And I think Rex Tillerson, uh, Secretary of State under the uh, Trump administration, uh, obviously, uh, by the way, as a side side note, uh, Eagle Scout, former Eagle Scout, ran the Boy Scouts of America. I'm an Eagle Scout as well, so mm. really proud of having him doing the job that he's doing. I think he's created a lot more tranquility in the, in the Middle East, and I'm hoping now he can find the solution over in North Korea as well. Short of Kim Jong-un backing down. Is there any way to stop this thing from moving forward? I mean, something's going to happen. I don't know what it is, whether he backs down or whether somebody fires something or does something. I mean, is there any way to defuse this short of him backing down? Can we throw him a bone? Is there? I mean, we're talking about a guy who allowed, I'm not sure how it, it happened, but allowed a college kid to basically be almost murdered in his country for taking a poster off a wall, you know, an American tourist. I mean, that, that's the kind of mentality of the person we're dealing with. And the other problem was that he's been sort of, uh, allowed to fester for a long time under previous presidential administrations. You know, we, you, you've seen this kind of build up and nobody's done anything to address the situation. Um, I think like everybody else, I'm not necessarily sure how this is going to play out, but I do think that uh, the world is watching. And I think that if the uh, if Kim Jong-un thinks that he's going to bully the United States, I think he's got another thing coming. What about Iran? Iran's been awful quiet lately. As a matter of fact, last time we heard from uh, the State Department, Iran seems to be cooperating, we're told, with, uh, uh, with the nuke deal that we uh, signed with them. Um, I, you know, I, we know that the North Koreans and the Iranians have been exchanging information back and forth. And how concerned are you that they're, 
a threat to be dealt with almost immediately as well. Well, that's, that's the problem. I mean, who is coercing the uh, Kim Jong-un and the North Koreans to be doing this? And you wonder if it's Iran trying to push to see what how far America will go to test themselves, because that was the other thing. The uh, the, the nuclear deal with Iran, which for a long time was proven to be a failure. They, they continued to develop uh, the uranium. They continued to develop what, what we see as sort of a program to develop these we- the nuclear weapons. You know, we saw a huge cash payout of uh, that ridiculous amount of that, you know, pallet of, of, of American money dropped off in, in Iran to sort of buy them off with this Iran nuclear deal, it seemed to be. And uh, it, it feels like they're, they're sort of looking right now to North Korea to see how far we're willing to go as a country. And I, uh, this may be a test for them as well to see what's going on. Now, what about China? China obviously has been uh, looming large on the stage, too. They've built those islands off of the uh, in the South China Sea. And they're basically the Philippines saying, basically trying to pressure the Philippines out of an alliance with the United yeah. States. It's been it's been another tricky one. I think China, uh, if they were to continue to alienate the United States, either with North Korea not trying to help find a solution or by continuing to pressure uh, what what were previously American partners in that region, I think they're going to alienate the United States to the point where we are their largest consumer of goods. I mean, we have to remember that all that they're producing, which is a lot, we are their, their largest customer. If Donald Trump decides that it's time to cut off or tariff or uh, you know, create an embargo on on uh, China for any reason because they're complicit in any of this that's going on. Uh, I think that that's always something that's on the table. And I, I don't want to see that. I mean, they are a consumer of our goods as well. They're a trade partner both ways. But right now, the imbalance has been to the point where China has been benefiting much more greatly. Um, and at the same time, we remember with the Paris uh, Climate uh, Treaty, you know, the United States was going to be held to this ridiculous financial commitment, and China wasn't even going to be held to any standards till 2030, if at all. Uh, so China needs to come to the table in many different ways. Uh, and I think, again, trying to create some strength in the region would be a, a, an asset for the long haul. Uh, you know, but I, again, we, we still have options. The United States always has options. Um, and I think that Donald Trump has been just having negotiations right now on the, on the, the it's not a budget. It's these continuing resolutions on how they spend money. Right now he's negotiating to try to make sure that our military uh, gets more financial investment. It's been kind of decimated over the Obama years to the point where he doesn't feel, and I think the military doesn't feel that they're ready to handle any of these major crises around the country, around the world, you know, if needed. So, uh, I think making sure our military is strong is going to be a big part. And the commitment commitment on Congress's part to make sure that our military remains strong is going to be a send a signal to China as well. Where do your interests lie in terms of committee assignments? Where would you like to serve? <laughs> That's funny. When I first uh, got to the state legislature up on Beacon Hill, I had a meeting with my minority leader, and I said that the two committees I really wanted to sit on were Ways and Means and the Rules Committee. And uh, I ended up getting both of those assignments. And it was funny because Tip O'Neill, uh, when he went down to Congress, wanted ways and means and rules. And ways and means, I think, for people who don't know this, is probably the most powerful committee as far as the fact that it everything that's spent by Beacon Hill or down in Washington, D.C., their ways and means committee, that's where all budget requests go through. And so, uh, to me, that gives you the best grasp on where dollars are being spent or misspent. Um, and I was able to find out up on Beacon Hill quite a bit about where dollars were being misspent. Mm. Uh, that is a, a... It's legendary. I would say that's the committee... To, to aim for because it really gives you that that immediate knowledge of what you can do to make an impact, not just down in Washington on, on curtailing wasted spending, but also making sure that Massachusetts gets a better share of what's going on. Right now we are, for every dollar we're sending down to Washington, I think we're only getting back 67 cents and that is not like what other states are getting. We are losing on the deal, generally speaking, with Washington, D.C. and yet we are we are one of the leading nations on, uh, leading con- states in the country on issues like showing people how education can be done. We, you know, we were a world leader in education. In medical, in the medical field, we are a world leader. Massachusetts should be getting a much better share uh, from Washington, and we need to have Washington be a better partner for us, you know, here in the state on other issues, uh, such as the fishing industry. Stop having NOAA continue to, Im- you know, impact in a negative way our fishing industry. Let's try to help. States like uh, Maine have a very robust lobstering industry. Our lobstermen, as a side note, are having a real tough time just making money off the catch after they have to pay for the uh, deckhand and the fuel out there because the, the, the what they're making off their lobster catch is not what it needs to be. Mm. You are still, for the moment at least, a member of the Massachusetts legislature representing uh, uh, um, uh, Whitman, the Whitman area where you're from. That's right. A lot of my listeners are pretty PO'd about the pay raise issue, which I think we've talked about, and the fact that they will not get a tax-free 
Can you imagine that? Tax-free weekend coming up this second weekend. year in a row. Yeah. Second year in a row that the Beacon Hill is not given a tax-free weekend, which puts us not competitive with New Hampshire. Just gives us one crack at a time period in the year when retailers are struggling. August is a tough month for retailers. People aren't, you know, back yet from vacations. They're not back into the fall routine of school and everything like that. And so what the sales tax holiday has always provided was a chance for retailers to jumpstart uh, and, and keep people employed over the summer when they needed it. And it cost the state, and when I say cost the state, you know, less tax received, roughly $20 million. Okay, now to put that in perspective, that pay raise, that legislative pay raise was $18 million a year. So $18 million a year now going to increase your legislator's pay, which, by the way, uh, I'm, I'm donating back the money that increased on my salary mandatorily, um, but I also voted against that pay increase and spoke on the floor against it because I said, what have the Massachusetts legislature done to try to earn that money? All I've seen since I've been up there is this attempt to try to increase the gas tax automatically without a vote, take that off their lap. They, they switched from what was working as a mass health system over to the Affordable Care Act, the Obamacare Act, and has been a financial disaster for us. You know, what decisions have they made that made them earn this $18 million pay raise uh, increase? And uh, couldn't really get many answers in that debate. Mm. They just rammed it through on the first day that we actually had, we were back in session. It was really audacious on their part. Something that I think they will likely be answering for in November uh, come election time if we get people that run against them and, and well, bring us up problem. as an issue. Yeah, I mean, around here we get no no competition, so we don't we don't have any choices, really. It's it's difficult. But, um, another issue that is going to be coming up when you guys get back, uh, the $15 minimum wage that's either going to go through you guys or it's going to wind up on the ballot. And uh, I know I have a lot of small business people that, that listen to the program, too, and they call in and say, look, they're killing us. My guess is it goes to the ballot, and unfortunately that seems to be the way. Le the legislature is punting on these issues, and they should be saying no to this. And I'll tell you why. We're already at $11 an hour mandated by the state. Okay, so that's one thing. Secondly is $15 minimum wage is a it's a training wage, first of all. It's a summer job wage, and it's a train. I'm sorry, not $15. Minimum wage is supposed to just be a summer job wage and a training wage. We were contacted by groups like uh, the YMCA who employ a lot of young folks and they asked for a carve out and they got it so that they are exempt from that minimum wage increase. They, they still pay under, uh, I think it's like eight and a quarter or they pay under the $11 just so you know because they were given a special exemption because they proved that it's summer wages. Well, how about all the small businesses out here that would love to have had that carve out or not be subject to government telling businesses what they have to pay people and that's really what the core issue is. You you have government saying, here's what you have to do as a company, that you, here's what you have to pay them. That's one. Then you have this new millionaire's tax they're going to be putting on the ballot. I'm sure you were going to mention that. The millionaire's tax says if you make over a million dollars, and by the way, if you're an S corp like my wife and I, we own a small business, you know, they take all the revenue from your company and they tack that onto your personal income and try to say that you're a millionaire. Mm. Okay. That is going to drive out people. Uh, who can afford to leave the state. It will drive out money that knows how to be offshored. Uh, and at the same time, it's government saying, you're going to make, you know, companies have to pay this much, and then if you make more than this, we're going to take it. We're going to take the additional. The same thing, they wanted Common Core to be a national curriculum to tell you what your education is, and they want control of health care. They want to make sure that government's going to tell you what you can have for health care. They're going to have to ration it out. They don't want to tell you that part. They want to tell you that uh, they want to control it to make sure everybody gets it. But when everybody gets it, let me tell you something. Everybody's going to get it. Yeah, they'll get it. But good. Like we got to wrap it up. Like Charlie Gard, that young infant from London, couldn't even get the couldn't even leave the country to get help uh, somewhere else when it was offered. Got to wrap it up, Jeff Deal. Appreciate you coming Thanks, in. Uh, we'll talk a, a lot more. I hope between now and the election. For Deal sure. for Senate dot com if they can make it. D i h l for Senate dot com. All right, you're listening to fourteen twenty WBSM News is next. Stay with us. We'll be back tomorrow. Worldwide on the WBSM app.